Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live and Dunoon Institute of Biblical Research. So it'll be airing on both those platforms today. Uh, and I guess you can already uh, see by the image on your screen, just as a prop here, uh, we're going to be talking about Joseph. And, uh, and I'm actually going to be, it's a short kind of a broadcast today, but uh, I've done this story so many times over the years. I think even in the book I wrote, Israel, They Still God's People, and maybe even in Yom Suf, uh, I write about the amazing similarities between Joseph and that of Jesus Christ, bringing out so many things uh, that most scholars never even considered. In fact, my third book I'm working on now I'll be going into that. What have rabbis missed? And the story of Joseph is one of those amazing stories that I see so many similitudes that are obviously overlooked. Uh, one of those, of course, uh, is when, uh, if you go later in the story of Joseph, when his brethren, uh, he goes down and he doesn't reveal himself at first, but they're on their way back home. They stop at the inn or the hotel, literally in Hebrew, it's the Bemalon the, at the hotel. Uh, and they're going to go feed their, their animals uh, in, the, in the stable there. And when they go to feed the animals in the stable, this is when his brothers first realized the money had been put back in their sacks. Well, that was no coincidence that that happened because it would be later, some, what, gosh, I don't know, 1,500 years later, that when Jesus would be rejected in his own mother's womb by his own brethren, that... Uh, it was at the hotel where he was rejected at, and where did he have to go? To a stable to be born. Uh, so it was no coincidence that the story of Joseph also had that very same similarity. Uh, many different things that I've brought out over the years and uh, through the story of Joseph there, uh, the scapegoat, the two goats, etc., all kinds of things. But this time, uh, I just kind of felt compelled to go back and look at the story once again. And as I did, I stopped over here, Genesis 37 at the beginning, and I began to see similar similitudes once again that I had not picked up on the first time. And this is some of the things that I wanted to share with you uh, as we looked at this here. And just starting off right with his coat, uh, and of course we know his father makes this coat for him. Uh, there's some, there's a debate too about the, where the, what the coat really was. In the Hebrew, in the Masoretic text, it puts it as a coat of long sleeves. And the, I think it's in the, um, uh, the, the old, uh, what is it? The old, uh, the Septuagint. I believe is a coat of many colors. So the Septuagint is actually older than the Masoretic text that we have today. And of course, the Masoretic text was after the time of Christ that that was put together, other than what we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, uh, but nonetheless, to me, the coat represented his royalty. Uh, that's what I look at when I look at this coat, that it represented royalty. He was favored above all of his brethren by his father in so much that he made this special coat for him that was like, to me, like a robe of royalty. Uh, so uh, what was interesting is that how that when he, he goes to spy on his brothers to see how they're, see what they're up to, uh, they see him coming, they hated him because of his dreams and his visions that he would have, uh, and they figured, okay, well, if we kill him, none of his dreams and visions are going to come to pass. And maybe that's what they had kind of thought with Jesus, you know, because Jesus did prophesy about the temple that there would not be one stone left upon another that would not be thrown down. And we know that the Jewish people knew this because at his trial, that's what they brought against him is that he was going to destroy the temple in three days and raise it back up again. Uh, well, you know, so it's kind of interesting that the Jewish people of 2,000 years ago, the Pharisees and Sadducees, also wanted him dead. And maybe it was because of their fear of him destroying the temple itself, uh, revealing the evils that were in. Like in the video I did just recently about uh, the renting of the veil. If you haven't seen it, you might want to go check that out. In fact, I'll try to remember to put that in the description here for you. 
But anyway, here's some things that I wanted to point out to you. And we're just going to look at chapter 37 here, uh, verse 23. And it came to pass when Joseph was come uh, unto his brethren, that they stripped Joseph of his coat, the coat of many colors that was on him. Uh, and they took him, cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. So let's stop right here for just a moment. They strip him of that coat of many colors. Why did they just throw him in the pit with the coat on? You ever think about that? Why not just throw him in the pit with the coat on? Why was it necessary to strip him of this coat? Well, I believe it's very obvious the reason why they stripped him of this coat was because it did represent his royal priesthood. It represented that he was a royal son of his father. And, and if you think about it, it, he would be the firstborn of Rachel, the very one that his father loved. Uh, we know that uh, Jacob loved Rachel to begin with more than he did with Leah. And uh, so in essence, Rachel should have been his first wife. So therefore, that would put uh, that would put Joseph as his firstborn, technically speaking. But it didn't happen that way uh, in that regards there because that's who his heart was for. Uh, but anyway, so they, they stripped the coat of, of those many colors off of him, and the reason being was to strip him of who he really was, his identity. Now, the odd thing is, if you think about that, that hasn't changed, even into this day. Uh, that is exactly what the sons of Israel are still trying to do to this day. They are trying to take with Jesus and strip him of his royal priesthood of who he really is, the Melchizedek, the true righteous son of God that he is, that he is the one that is the rightful heir. They want to strip him. They want to strip his identity. They want to take away him being the Messiah, him being the true son of Almighty God. And what's happening is his whole essence of who Jesus Christ really is, is under attack like never before. And it's done in such a subtle way. They don't deny him being their brother. Isn't that interesting? Same thing with, uh, with you know, Jacob, excuse me, uh, saying, yeah, same thing with uh, uh, Joseph's brother, brothers of his day. They don't deny the fact that he was their brother. They just don't want his identity to be put at the forefront and them to be put at the back on a back row seat, so to speak. And this is exactly why they are trying even to this day to strip him of his position. Watch what happens in the different, uh, the, the different onslaught of information that is coming out to the public. Everywhere you look at, Jesus is under attack and by rabbinical community. Not that they say that he wasn't uh, a descendant of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but rather of his priestly position. They just tell you he was just another Jewish guy, so to speak, right? He's just one of us. And really and truly, they even strip him by stripping away the very teachings that he did and to try to alter them and pervert them. And that's something I find fascinating in this. And then we look at this here. What do they do? They take and they throw him, they cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Why doesn't the scripture just say they threw him into a pit? What does it got to do with the water? Why is he even a mention? of the water. Well, you know, that reminded me of Jeremiah's prophecy right here, right? Where in Jeremiah chapter 2, I believe it is, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And that's exactly what not only did, did, did uh, Joseph's brothers do to him, throwing him into a pit, a pit being similar, to, I mean, granted, a cistern is a man-made well. 
And that cistern there, or that pit they threw G, uh, Joseph in, couldn't hold any. There was no water in that pit. They just throw it, throw it basically in an old dried up well. And they, and, this, and we find in Jeremiah that, that God prophesies or spoke about Israel that they had committed two evils. They had forsaken him being the living God, the fountain of living waters, and they had hewed themselves out cisterns, broken cisterns that could hold no water. Well, interestingly enough, Joseph goes out to his brethren and not only do they strip him of who he is, his identity of who he is, and he represented a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ who was the fountain of water. He was the living waters. Like he said to the woman at the well, he said, if you knew it was, it was talking to you, you would ask me for a drink and you wouldn't even have to come to this well that Jacob dug. I'd give you waters that would flow from your belly. But they had forsaken that water. They had forsaken the very one there was the living water. And the same thing happened to Joseph's brethren. They stripped him of his identity, tried to hide it from the world of who he really was, throw him into a pit like a cistern that could hold no water. And they had forsaken their own brother. The brother that in the type he was of Jesus Christ, that was a living water, a well springing forth from the belly. And I thought that was so interesting. And then what did they do? It says, and they sat down to eat bread. But the bread they sat down to, again, was just a natural bread. There was no life in that bread. As we read here in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And that's another interesting analogy too. They sit down to eat bread, right? They're arguing over here in Jesus' time about him being the bread of life. And the same thing in Genesis here about the story of Joseph. They sat down to eat bread and they lifted up their eyes and looked and behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites are coming from Gilead with their, cam uh, their camels bearing spicery and balm and landum and going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brethren, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Just like Jesus, we already know the story. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver by Judas, supposedly one of his own, one of his very 12 disciples. The same thing happens to Jesus. Even the very names of the brethren, Simeon, Simon, hears, the one that hears. You know, if you go into the whole story, and I've done this before, and I don't recall everything right off the top of my head there, so you have to look up those stories that I'd done before about Joseph. Amazing, amazing insights there. But every one of his brethren's names and what they did, Reuben, etc., all bore the significance of their own crimes or their own standing with him. Because we find out when his brother comes back that had left and everything, uh, what was it, uh, which brother was it? Yeah, Reuben, Reuben returned to the pit and behold Joseph was not in the pit and he rent his clothes and he returned to his brethren and he said the child is not and is for me whither shall I go <laughs> see same thing same thing that was happening over here Jesus talks about him being the living bread and says the Jews strove among themselves same thing that was happening back then they're sitting down to eat bread and what are they doing the next thing you know they're arguing over what's going on Reuben was like, what have you done? And if I'm not for, uh, forgetting, I believe Reuben's name in Hebrew means behold a son. Wow. Yeah, it's just amazing to me uh, of, of what, they, what they did here. Now, here's another interesting one as well, right? They took Joseph's coat, killed he, a he goat, dipped the coat in blood, and they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, 
This have we found. Know, uh, know now whether this is your son's coat or not. Trying to cover up their sins. Trying to hide them. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. What did Jesus say? You remember what Jesus said? This is kind of interesting in itself, right? Matthew, I'm over here in Matthew 24. I was doing another study preparing for you, but um, I ended up changing my mind on which direction I was going to go. Matthew chapter 23, right? What did Jesus say? Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. Feel you up the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? So yeah, it was an evil beast. Not only, they, they see the thing is, they accused an evil beast of killing their brother. And the future generation, the Pharisees, would be a mingled seed mixed in amongst a reptilian race that would kill Jesus. So it literally is a prophecy when they put in there an evil beast hath devoured him because the true Joseph, the true Jesus would be killed by an evil beast. And it would be a Pharisaic reptilian dynasty that would do it, Satan himself, his own children, and we know the scriptures already said that the bloodshed of all the righteous would be upon you from the blood of Abel all the way down to Zechariah. And then, of course, the blood of Jesus Christ. Imagine, you know, you talk about, they talk about John F. Kennedy when he was killed and say, you know, what would it be like to know that you killed the president of the United States and you're sitting in a prison waiting for the people being angry, what they would do to you. Imagine what it'll be like when you stand on the day of judgment, knowing that you're, that you killed Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about, I mean, of course, the scripture says we, we crucify him afresh and put him to an open shame. And maybe that's a different message I should deal with it as well. But I'm talking about that generation that called for his blood. That's a serious thing, friends. Very serious thing. And Jacob rent his garments and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, no, but I will go down to the grave to my son mourning. I kind of looked at that for a moment and I couldn't help but think, I know it's not an exact similitude, but I thought to myself, you know, that's exactly what the true heavenly father did. He knew what was going to happen. But no doubt he mourned for the death of his son, Jesus Christ. And he did go down to the grave. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Thank you for listening. Uh, and we thank you, too, for your support of the broadcast here. Uh, right on our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org, you can see uh, our um, P.O. Box address, 156 Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872. Or if you'd like to, if God lays on your heart to support the work here, you can donate online.